Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome back to the Intelligent Automation Week Live. My name is Sally Fletcher, Head of Online Events for IQPC Digital, and I'm delighted to be hosting this session today on behalf of SSON. So we're looking at a topic that is very, very interesting, and I know a lot of you have requested, and that's about data. Um, so this session is entitled Data Automation, the New Battleground in the Mortgage Industry. And it's going to be giving you some insight based on what our experts are seeing from the mortgage industry that you can apply directly to your organizations. Um, just to give you a little bit of insight into your console, um, if you've attended every session, I'm sorry you're hearing this again. But um, just to emphasize that our speakers are here live. So please do ask questions of them in the Q&A box to the left hand side of your screen. You can also zoom in on those slides if you want to see anything closer. Um, and it's also the speaker's biographies to the right hand side. Um, and finally, there's a resource center to the bottom of your screen. Um, you can click on this and download a report, which is hot off the press today. Um, it's also titled Data Automation, the new battleground to the mortgage industry and goes further in depth on this topic. So I would really recommend you click on that um, and, and make sure you download that during this presentation. So our two speakers today, we've got Mike Hobday, the SVP for Antworks in Europe. I've heard Mike speak several times and he always gives some great practical insight. He's joined by Vivek Shivpuri, CEO and founder of Mosaic. I'm going to hand over to Mike first to lead us in our next presentation. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Sally. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, as Sally said, we're going to talk about... Um, intelligent automation, data automation, big focus in, on the mortgage industry. But, you know, emphasizing Sally's point, um, uh, it's the battleground in most industries, in fact, and uh, certainly in the outsourcing and offshoring industry, it's a very hot topic. So I'm sure what we're going to talk about today will be equally applicable to uh, every industry. So I'm, I'm not alone. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Vivek Shipuri. Um, uh, who is the chief executive of um, Mosaic, um, an organization which itself is using uh, automation to completely transform the mortgage industry. So um, we're going to be diving into what he's been doing. Um, but first, I'll do, before I uh, ask him to introduce himself, I'll give you a quick introduction. Uh, I'm actually the chief revenue officer for, um, for Antworks um, and have been uh, at Antworks for the last 12, uh, 12 months. Uh, leading um, the uh, intelligent automation uh, platform that we've developed, which um, includes both robotic process automation, but importantly in relation to this conversation, cognitive machine reading, um, which transforms the ability to uh, process unstructured data. Uh, before joining um, Antworks, I was actually general manager for uh, IBM running intelligent automation in Europe. Um, and in relation to this conversation, I was uh, reflecting last night as I put some notes together that uh, 40 years ago, um, I was actually working for a bank and I was actually a mortgage clerk. So um, I have some perspectives and in my work in the mortgage industry, I've noted that um, whilst things are changing, the actual, the actual main processes don't seem to be very different even after all this time. Uh, so that's a good uh, moment to welcome Vivek. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Because you don't have a typical mortgage um, background, do you, Vivek? Vivek, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> that happens all the time. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, my background is in uh, technology. I started off in technology consulting and uh, I've done a number of things um, in, in, in the technology space, including besides consulting, uh, this is the third product company that I'm building. Um, so I've uh, built a number of services firms, in mostly in financial services, and um, a, a number of product firms. And this is the third product firm that I'm building. This product firm called Mosaic is very much related to one of the services firm that I built in early earlier this decade, which was called Trinity Partners, uh, which was a mortgage outsourcing firm, um, mortgage and title outsourcing firm, one of the first mortgage and out title outsourcing, or in this case, offshoring firms 
that um, that's what was built, and um, and um, um, you know, uh, it's. I will get into why I kind of jumped back into the mortgage space after many years as we go through this deck. Uh, it's a very interesting time in the mortgage space as well as in the automation space. And that's a brief background of what I've done. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Well, we better explain. Uh, I mean, congratulations on the brand because you managed to squeeze bo both AI and IQ into into your brand, into a single brand name. So. Um, I bet lots of people are very <laughs> jealous, but I want to say a little bit about Mosaic and introduce it to Mosaic for the audience. Yeah, so we're a we're a process um, we're a process uh, uh, automation company that's solely focused on automating in the mortgage and title space. We don't do healthcare, we don't do invoice processing, we don't do anything else except automation in the mortgage space. That's the only thing we do. Um, and like I mentioned, one of the reasons I came back into the mortgage space to kind of do this is, I look at where we are, uh, candidly, we're in wave three, but let me go through wave one and two to kind of describe to you how we get to wave three. So wave one was, I was very much a part of wave one when we outsourcing and offshoring in the mortgage space first started. It was an extremely difficult chore. Uh, most of the people, uh, if when I say most of the people, I'm talking about most of the outsourcers, right? Or offshores were doing, uh, what was the easiest uh, task to do and high, uh, you know, high volume task to do, like HR outsourcing, FNA outsourcing, those were the things that were going on in wave one. What we decided with Trinity Partners was to attack the offshoring space vertically by doing only mortgage and title offshoring. And that was wave one, and it was difficult mm -hmm. because there wasn't enough knowledge to do the offshoring bit. So we had to train a lot of people, uh, the processes were new to everybody, um, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward 10 years and offshoring in the mortgage space is easily done at scale now in India, Philippines, anywhere around the world, right? There's lots of people, lots of talent uh, available to do it because a lot of people have been trained fast forward 10 years and now even 20 years further, you know, this is a, essentially becomes a commodity, right? So you move from, um, you know, a very, very difficult problem, and in 10, 20 years, it becomes a commodity. And this is where we are in the automation space as well, where most people are attacking the automation space by doing the low-hanging fruit, uh, which is, let me do invoice processing, let me do F, you know, finance, HR, et cetera, automation. There are very few people that are attacking the space from a vertical perspective. Um, so we decided to go and attack the space from a vertical perspective again, and um, that's what I call wave three. And it's, it's lots of analogies to when we first started offshoring. It's very difficult. There are lots of issues. Um, it takes time to do a lot of things. These documents that we work with, and we'll get into the details of this, are very complex. Um, mm -hmm. So we're in the early stages of doing this. And you know, if I fast forward, look in, into the future, 10, 20 years, I hope that a lot of these digital workers that we're building today will be ultimately become commodities as well. So that's the way we look at the world. That's one of the reasons I came back into the space. Yeah. So those and of you that are not in the market. Yeah, I was going to say, it's very exciting. And, and actually, what you're pioneering in the mortgage industry, we're seeing in insurance and, and many other sectors which are bound by these you know, core processes where uh, I think there's a new opportunity when, within the convergence of AI and robotics to bring about transformation. So, uh, so, so, so I know you've got some great stats. Do you want to talk to this slide? Yeah, sure. So um, there's, besides the fact that, you know, doing it vertically is an exciting thing for me to do, um, when I look at automation and I look at what automation would be good for in general, right? Uh, when, when is it appropriate to use a digital worker with, versus when is it just okay to use a digital worker or when it's you know not a great value to use a digital worker? The mortgage space has its ups and downs, and it's in the U.S. It's based on interest rates. So if I'm a mortgage company and I have 400 people in operations, I'm geared up to do, say, a billion dollars in originations a month. And interest rates go up, all of a sudden, I'm not required to do a billion dollars. I'm only required to do 750 million a month. 
So now I have 400 people that w could do a billion, but I'm only using, you know, 75% of my workforce or the operations team. So that happens all the time. The fluctuation in the mortgage industry, as you can see on the slide, in terms of profitability, is up and down quarter by quarter because the interest rates are changing and mortgage companies are not scaled or effectively right-sized for that volume. You can't right-size your company every quarter, right? So with, with digital workers, you can add and subtract digital workers on the fly, right? So I don't have to put a digital, once I've created a digital worker for a process, guess what? I don't have to train another digital worker on that process. I just deploy another digital worker, right? So I can scale my business and scale that business up and down um, in accordance with like an accordion workforce. And that's absolutely, um, I would say, you know, the what all mortgage companies are essentially looking for to be able to scale up and down with the business that they're getting in any business, right? The other critical part piece here is that it's surprising, but origination costs have been going up each and every year. And it's $9,000 now to originate the loan. And, um, you know, those costs, as long as they keep going up, the profitability of a mortgage bank is going to be effective unless you use automation or software to offset some of those costs, right? So now bringing all this together in, in, um, in what's the volume and how much, of, or how much is being done, if you look at the chart on the, left, on the right, you know, this is gangbusters time for the mortgage industry. They, we're, we're going to do over close to $3 trillion in originations this year, right? So you combine the fact that origination costs are going up. This industry is suited very much to automation because of the variability in, in, in the volumes. It's a growing industry. And now AI and data-driven technologies have reached a point where you can actually do a lot of that data extraction. It's hard. Don't get me wrong. It's hard, but you can still do a lot of that accurate data extraction from the unstructured mortgage documents. That helps in makes makes this an optimal time to attack this industry from an automation perspective. And I think it'd be true to say, Vivek, that what, one of the barriers to transformation has been unstructured data because the, the number of different parties that are involved, intermediaries and, uh, and obviously buyers and sellers and their representatives, um, uh, there, there are a lot of documents that flow uh, through the mortgage process from the typical know your customer KYC uh, documentation to property documentation and and obviously all of the application uh, information. Uh, and that's always required a lot of people. And hence, I guess, that's why there was a labor arbitrage, um, you know, 10 years ago or so. Um, so, so I think it is the data extraction from unstructured data that really opens up the... Um, uh, opens up the industry for automation. Is that how you see it? Yeah, so I'll just, I mean, for those people that are slightly technical or have done a little bit of data extraction in the past, I'll give you some numbers, right? Um, mm -hmm. a very, the first application you fill in on a mortgage document is a 1003. A 1003 is about yeah. five to six pages, right? Um, there may be different variations of the 1003. So if you've done any data extraction, we've already, we've identified 377 fields to be extracted from those five pages. So you see the density of the extraction, right? And that's 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 a challenging technical problem to extract, be mm -hmm. able to extract from tables, from check boxes, from you know, um, from from tables going across pages, right? So these are all nuances that happen in these mortgage documents that is that, that make it very difficult to extract the data from. And that the 1003 as a document has always been the source of truth, right? So that's where a mortgage processor goes and looks at the 1003 and says, oh, this is the loan amount, or this is the person's assets, or these are the person's liabilities, right? So how do I make a decision, an underwriting decision? It all comes from these documents. So in order to, you have to be able to extract this data in not only just extract it from a very dense document, but extract it accurately. Yeah, so the, it's a complex problem. Yeah. I mean, I just gave you an example yeah. of one, one document. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the number of documents. And how many? Documents, based how, how many? Yeah, how many documents? Yeah, do you think there are in the process? 
So typical mortgage file yeah. is about 500 to 700 pages, right? And uh, mm -hmm. seven, 500 to 700 pages with the first process that most people do is index or classify those mortgage documents into, it depends on bank to bank. So there's some variability there as well, but typically 300 categories is where these documents get classified into. So there's 300 documents and we've identified about 16,000 fields from those 300 documents that could be extracted. We're not gonna extract 16,000 fields. We're only gonna extract the ones that really make make sense. But yeah. there are 16,000 fields from those in, in our data dictionary that we keep track of that, yeah. we, we, that we'll, we, we go against. So that's how big the problem is. It's, it, and and, and uh, when we hit wave four, perhaps we actually will be doing the 16,000, who knows? So, uh, well, let not, me, not so we, just... but digital workers. <laughs> the bots will be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right, absolutely right. Let, let, let yeah. me just uh, spend a couple of seconds just some examples uh, of the mortgage industry. Well, the, uh, the 1003 is actually included on the uh, amongst documents um, on the left-hand side that Nelson Hall have worked with us to test. So, Anworks has an intelligent document processing solution, which we call cognitive reading. And um, the, on the on the left-hand side, you've got examples from the industry as, as to uh, to demonstrate and view. And and there we're using our solution, for example, with John Hancock Manu Life to uh, read uh, insurance servicing and insurance claims forms. Uh, there. You could argue they're semi-structured, but they're barely semi-structured, and they're including handwriting. And we're achieving 94% readability um, using our solution. Uh, but because the, you know the, the, this class of solution is based on patterns um, uh, and uh, pattern recognition, we call it fractal science. Um, it takes images and, and logos too. So the reason the mini that is there is we're able to look at the damage on a mini and compare it with an insurance claim form. Um, but also on the left-hand side of the work we're doing um, in commercial insurance where uh, we're reading uh, documents two, 300 pages long, um, whether it's insurance slips or insurance policies, um, and, in, and, and uh, taking folders, you know, a bit like a mortgage application folder, but an insurance uh, a folder of documents that you're using to negotiate a, um, uh, an insurance policy, and we're able to compare the folder with the final insurance policy. So the sophistication... Um, I think it's early days in this industry, but the sophistication is coming and coming quickly as uh, as, our, as knowledge and experience of artificial intelligence in the extraction area improve. And, and on the right-hand side, um, we did an exercise with the Nelson Hall. They took six leading providers. Obviously, if I'm putting the, the four-box model, we're top right-hand side. But, but there they took the 1003 and a number of other documents from all the way from tweets to 1003s. Uh, and, and tested, um, did a, a bake-off of solutions. Um, so it does show that the industry um, is, is moving. And the reason for the safe door is that um, you're, you're not only extracting the data, I think, um, and, t and tell me if you have a different view, for processing, but actually uh, putting all of that data into structured form reliably actually opens that data up for uh, analysis, uh, for creating value from new data insights that you get as more and more of your unstructured data in an organization becomes becomes visible. And I, I don't see don't know whether you're seeing that, Vivek, and your thoughts about as as you automate processing in mortgages um, that actually can't see patterns in the data which you can use for uh, for new business opportunities and new processing enhancements. Yes, yeah, certainly is, is that and something we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's certainly what we see, and we'll talk about that Great. a little bit. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, just a little bit about, so I positioned it as mortgages, but this is an opportunity for everyone, uh, whatever your industry, um, to 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 uh, consider. Let, let, let's go back, and perhaps you could talk, talk about how you see your platform uh, that uh, you're using to the transformation to Wave 3. Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we clearly um, understand and most people should understand at the beginning, uh, at least on the mortgage space, I'm sure it's true in other spaces, is that there are certain foundational processes that you need to get right before you start the automation journey, right? Um, and the automation journey, um, it could be 
you know, simple RPA stuff, or it could be data extraction and RPA. But whatever you, you need, you need to get the fund. At least in the mortgage space, you need to get the foundational processes right. And those, there are two foundational processes, broadly speaking. Um, one of them is indexing, and the second one is data extraction. And we've, you know, talked a lot about that. Um, and indexing is really classifying that mortgage package into 300 different categories. And data extraction is being able to extract effectively and accurately um, the the data of those classified mortgage documents individually. Um, so we've done that. That's the first thing we did when we built our product. The next thing we did was, uh, well, how do we help mortgage banks? Right? Because they do indexing and data extraction, but that that by itself is not a solution. Right? We're a solution company, right? Uh, we, 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 we don't go into a mortgage bank and say, hey, we do indexing and data extraction, use us, right? We go into a mortgage bank and say, we do loan setup. We've automated these following processes, right? So how do we go from uh, the foundational processes to uh, being able to do automation at a vertical process level for mortgage banks, right? In order to do that, we had to build a reusable mortgage digital worker library. Um, and the library includes integration with third party as well as major mortgage platforms, because oftentimes, um, we are not using RPA necessarily to talk to the mortgage platform. We are using the APIs via bots, still automated, but you're using APIs to talk to the mortgage platform. Um, we need to be able to configure business rules in outside the outside the outside the actual code itself. Like um, mortgage bank A might want. Uh, you know, these 300 different classifications and name them differently. Whereas mortgage bank B might want only 100 classifications and might name them differently, right, uh, for the loan documents. Um, the last one is uh, we also we also do a lot of, when you're doing the data extraction, um, if you have, if you've done data extraction in the past, you'll find that um, there's sometimes the data extraction requires from these mortgage documents, requires a lot of post-processing. And that's part of what we do in the reusable data library. The post-processing, um, what I mean by post-processing essentially is, um, the examples of post-processing would be, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this quick example would be, um, you know, you take an amortization table and we extract it as a, as a paragraph, and then we need to reconvert it into an amortization table for, for the mortgage bank to be able to use. Lastly, we have detailed reporting because without reporting, you don't know what's going on with the bots, right? Uh, so both system and business exceptions, I need to keep track of that. We all, we've also studied the industry extensively because we've, you know, a lot of our team obviously comes from the industry and we've identified the top eight processes that people should start with because one of the things that most people ask us is, okay, I, I want to automate, I'm ready to automate, what do I, how do I get started? What processes do should I do first? What will give me the biggest bang for my buck? So we have a whole methodology around how we analyze processes, and you know we've kind of shown the top eight processes that we sh you should automate for the for the mortgage industry. If you're a servicing company, your top eight processes might be slightly different. If you're originated, then these are probably you know uh, you know fall in line with more what you would want to do. Cool. Um, are these the processes uh, that? They yeah, so uh, a little more analysis on these. Um, the first process, uh, they're not in any 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 order, but um, uh, but you can kind of get a sense for you know the automation feasibility of these processes in general. Now this changes from bank to bank, but this is in general. Um, and then how much human processor time each one of these processes takes, right? And what your annual savings would be if you were doing about five thousand files a month, right? Um, and these annual assumptions are based on US FTE costs. Uh, they, of course, do not use the, uh, include automation costs, but at the same time, you know, they don't include any of the operational efficiencies that you're getting. A lot of times, I want to emphasize this point a lot, a lot of times people focus on the cost advantages of, of automation. Um, but at least in the mortgage industry, and I'm sure in other industries as well, the operational efficiencies that you get from automation are the softer benefits that are left unsaid. Specifically, you know, in the mortgage case, if you're a mortgage bank, I'll give you a great example. 
you know, you borrow money to lend money, right? So mm -hmm. you're borrowing money in a warehouse line at a certain rate, and then you're lending it out by setting, you know, by making, you know, making mortgages. And the faster you can use the money you borrow, turn it around, right? The faster you can do your work, the more money you'll make on the money that you borrowed. Right, so if I can if I can do a mortgage in thirty days versus sixty days, I, I've effectively mm -hmm. you know earned the thirty days extra uh, in terms of interest that I was paying on my warehouse line, right? So I'm using my warehouse line repeatedly again. So, um, so there are operational efficiencies that can be quantified. Mm -hmm. A lot of the operational efficiencies cannot be quantified, but you know I think uh, uh, um, once you get into doing this, you'll realize that the operational efficiencies are almost equally as important as the cost benefits that you're getting. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got the a case study that view. we can have a, a quick look at. Yeah, is that, is that yeah. helpful, the, the, the case study? Yeah, the case study is uh, one of our clients, um, the Loan Store. Um, you know, we, we've been working them, with them from the very beginning. Uh, they've added people, of course, in this environment. They've, you know, almost added, uh, you know, 88% 80, more folks to their, their workforce because they're growing. Um, but they've also, um, and they have a cost for the automation, which basically takes their cost from 1x to 2.32x. So they've increased their cost a little more than double their cost, but they're doing six times more volume with the mm -hmm. operational Isn't efficiencies as well as the... Uh, automation that we've put in place for them. And these are incredible numbers, right? So this is what you can do in terms of getting operational efficiencies. Um, they have, of course, compressed. So this is this, these are benefits coming from them. Okay, honestly, I did not put this slide together. They put this slide together, right? <laughs> Com compressed turnaround times, reduced errors, better audit trail, easier to scale, and it improves, improves employee morale because your employees are no longer doing the mundane stare and compare work that they used to do, and they're actually doing you know more more uh, more challenging work. So mm -hmm. that's the that's the uh, upshot from a, a quick case study that we put together. Yeah, and that's great because I mean I could imagine given the power of these numbers. That if you're if you've got a bank that's uh, outsourced their operations, which is not uncommon, um, you know, mm -hmm. on renewal before they're going to ex expecting their uh, offshore providers, their outsourced providers, to um, uh, be advancing these these sorts of solutions. So uh, everyone has to sit up because if you don't transform, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, that's a great point. If I was running a BPO company right now, I'd be worried. Right, because I'd be worried because my, my oh yeah, you're absolutely right. I'd be worried because my clients are going to say, well, BPO company A is saying that hey, they'll automate this stuff for me and it'll cost this much, and you're saying I still have to use human labor to do this much or this much cost. So yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I'm, I'm I'm being I'm being I'm joking a little bit, but I you know this is not this is not new news to for BPO companies, yeah. right? They they and I, I, if, you, I if you it's a real worry. Yeah, it's a real worry for the leaders because. Their, uh, their business model predicated on human workers and uh, uh, not generally uh, not being rewarded for out for the number of number of um, workers actually processing um, the, the, the these loans or loan applications and, and therefore uh, the industry needs to find a solution for how do I um, get um, uh, recompense for digital workers and you know I guess it means it's more a move to um, uh, business models which are predicated on value, not on, not on headcount. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, that, and that shift has been going on in the BPO space even when I used to work in there. So yeah, yeah it's not it's not new, uh, but it's no, it, it's no. been ex obviously this ex this accelerates. I think it's accelerating though, and I think the uh, the pandemic uh, challenges of operational in you know, a business continuity of. Uh, accelerated, and yeah. I think the digital worker has the benefit is um, uh, COVID hasn't worked out how to infect a digital worker yet, so uh, uh, there are some indeed <laughs> benefits of it. <laughs> um, <Good point>. uh, <laughs> anyway, so I think it's a good one um, as we draw to close because we want to leave some time for 
questions, right? Um, is uh, is people always want to hear about the uh, what should I definitely be doing and what should I be avoiding? And I think um, it'd be great to hear your 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 point of view. Yeah, thank you for saying that because this is this is definitely my point of view, right? It's what <laughs> we've experienced. I think people, if if people might have rearranged this deck differently or this this slide differently, depending on what happened to them. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, uh, so, you know, one of the gotchas is change management and everybody says, yeah, you know, change management, obviously, why are you putting that in there? But it did come back to bite us at, at one client. Right. So and on one process, because, um, you know, um, in, 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 for change management, the specific thing on the mortgage side, I think, is you got to keep in mind, you know, for most change management is IT, which is technology, then business, and then process, right? Keep them in sync, make sure that everybody knows what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. So if changes happen, you know, it flows across the organization. Uh, for us, and maybe in the insurance industry as well, um, compliance is a big deal, right? And rules are always changing, right? So yeah. that's, 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 a, that's, that's an important factor for us that, that is important to keep in mind. So I like to put that there because that's a, that's a key got you in the mortgage industry because you got to get everybody on board with what you're doing in those disciplines that you that you that you're talking through and make sure that everybody is on the same page as changes happen in the organization so that nothing it, no there are no surprises and nothing breaks i think my favorite one though is the second one which is data extraction from mortgage documents is time consuming and a complex problem right um, so We've talked about extracting data. These are complex documents. These are unstructured documents. You know, even if you're looking at some of these standard documents, even the standard documents have variations. So you got to train your um, train your train your uh, ML and AI engines to uh, add, add with a number of examples of those documents. You got to have post processing built in, and then even after you do that, you still have what I call the last mile problem, which is is the data clean enough and accurate enough to go into a system of record, right? And what data do you need to flag and what data do you not flag and take straight into a system of record? So what data do you have somebody review and what data do you have somebody, you know, a human review and what data do you have take directly? But there's still this last mile problem and there's many ways to solve the last mile problem. Uh, for example, you could use internal validations. So, you know, like names is something that there is not a great um, dictionary for, right? Uh, addresses, mm -hmm. there's a dictionary for in the sense that I could use, if I wanted to know if I captured the address correctly, I could use the API and figure out that this is an accurate address. Names, you know, my name is very different than somebody else's name. So, uh, you know, there's no great dictionary for names, right? Or it's too big. I'll be using that as an example. So, um, what you need to do in, in the name, in the case of a name, is you probably take two, three documents and verify that you've got the right name. So you know you might have to do internal validations to make sure that you're getting the right name, the right right data that before you put it into um, into the into the next thing. So I, I highlight this because you know this is this is something that is glossed over and it is a big big um, for us at least it takes the most amount of time in our business to get this right. Uh, uh, in, in at least in the mortgage space. I think the last one uh, mm -hmm. in the gotchas is we found that traditional RPA, which is just mimicking what a human does on the screen, is not always the right choice for automation. And many times you've mm -hmm. used um, you know Python, Python to do the automation instead of traditional RPA. Other times we've used APIs to do the automation because it's much faster and it doesn't depend on on um, on the screens. And it's especially important for us because if we have the APIs well defined and we can work with an API for a vendor like Encompass, um, then we can do the automation uh, much uh, from one bank to another much easier because the screens change from bank one bank to the other, but the you know the underlying APIs allow us to do a more uh, create create a more reusable solution that we can use across banks. Yeah, and I think that's uh, uh, the trend I've been witnessing, kind of switch from RPA yeah. to APIs. Uh, I, I think um, Vivek, we're going to have to leave the obvious uh, and let people yeah. read it because I think we want to hand back to Sally.
I encourage people to read the obvious. Um, and, uh, and and Sally, I'm not sure whether we've got time for questions. because uh, Yeah, but, let's uh, do some questions. Yeah, um, so to everyone, it's question time now. Put your questions into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, don't ask anything personal. We just want to know about intelligent automation. Um, and well, while you're doing know. that, I just... <laughs> Um, and while you're doing that, I just wanted to remind you that there's a really cool resource in the Resource Center for this session. Um, it's um, of the same name as a session, so it's focusing on data automation. So make sure you download that um, during the session and have a read afterwards. So let's go directly to our first question. Um, and I'll direct this question to you, Vivek. It's because mortgage is a highly regulated sector, do you feel challenges like non-compliance while automating the work? Yeah, um, I think there's. The, yeah, it, it is a challenging. It's it's not like um, you know we. Um, one of the things that we do with uh, whoever we work with is you know we can't say oh here's here's our platform go at it or we can't say oh let's let's let, let me give you these docs and you can work on on your platform. It has to be done within a regulated environment, whether it's technical or whether it's people involved. So it's it's data sharing and all this stuff in terms of PII information, et cetera, is very difficult. So um, uh, if you look at, if you go to our website and you look at our, our demos as an example, we've de you see the demos with a lot of things blanked out because you know there's a lot of PII information there that you can't share. So because of all this regulation and the PII information, it is, it is very much a challenge to work with people uh, outside our organization um, because we have to follow a lot of rules um, to make sure that we're uh, you know, in, in, in line with all the PII regulations that, um, that are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, and a question that's come through for you, Mike, um, is about how will a consumer benefit from the automation in mortgage? Is that something that you can help with? Well, I think I think Vivek actually touched on it um, in his um, uh, his case study. But uh, it, whenever you're driving automation, if it's done well, um, you're going to uh, reduce human error uh, and it's then therefore improve quality, and the and customers will see that. Um, you're going to re uh, reduce uh, significantly the uh, the elapsed time for for processing, so uh, the consumer will get a much faster service and more accurate service. Um, and, and of course, you know that's driving a cost reduction uh, for um, and, and productivity improvements, as we've seen in Vivex's uh, case, um, which uh, give the uh, service provider, whether it's mortgages or any other industry, uh, options about you know about uh, moving price points and becoming more competitive. So, I see it as a win-win both for um, uh, for companies uh, and for end consumers. And actually, uh, for, for many of us, many working in those industries, because the routine, which, you know, is pretty boring, is removed and people focus on uh, on the more interesting quality control on, on checking key data points, as, as Vivex uh, discussed. So uh, I think the consumer will see significant benefits. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, another question that's come through for you, Mike, is about um, RPA shortfalls. So um, Glenn is asking, are RPA shortfalls due to product or the solution method or technology? Um, and is RPA suited better for legacy platforms? Gosh, there's a lot in that question, isn't there? Yes, there uh, is. I mean, they're, they're to start with the, um, <laughs> the shortfalls, what are the kind of key short, shortfalls up around <laughs> RPA and why might the project <laughs> fail? I, I think often uh, RPA uh, shortfalls aren't the short shortfalls of the product. They're the uh, shortfalls in the selection of the process for automation for where RPA is being deployed. Um, it's often uh, brittleness of RPA, because not because the RPA itself is at fault, um, but because back-end systems are changed and because um, uh, RPA is very much driven by... Um, you know, prescribed, uh, you know, um, 
uh, sequences of, 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 of activity. Um, you know, as soon as there's a screen change in the back end system, the RPA goes down. So, I, I, uh, and then the other bit about RPA, I think, in my experience of the last three or four years with all of the vendors, actually, before I came to Antworks, um, was actually organization. So, RPA has often been seen as a quick, quick cost reduction rather than being part of a broader digital strategy as, as just one automation tool alongside. APIs and, uh, and and AI tools. Brilliant. I hope that Thank answers you. part of the question anyway. Yes. Yeah, I definitely think it does. Um, I mean, I could talk to you guys all day, but sadly we've come to the end of our time. So if you guys did ask questions, and don't worry, I will send them to Mike and to Vivek and they right. will get back to you. Um, just to recap on today, um, so we had some fantastic sessions today. We looked at how startups are breaking the IE rules for speed and agility. Um, we've go to energy and blue prism. We then looked at how to scale up your program with Spotify, returning back to work safely differently and digitally with IA, with Nintex and BN Builders. And finally, data automation, the new battleground in the mortgage industry with Antworks and Mosaic. And why am I telling you this? Because all all of the sessions are available on demand for the next two weeks. So please share with your colleagues, with your peers, with anyone that you think might find them useful. You can log back in and listen again. Tomorrow, we have an equally exciting lineup. We're kickstarting at nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time. That's two o'clock in the UK. Um, and looking at from newbie to pro, how to fill your automation pipeline with high quality opportunities. So this is a session that helps you find new automated opportunities, no matter the maturity of your RPA project. Um, and that's with Agilify. Following that, we have a session at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, 3 o'clock British Summer Time with DHL. So I've heard this guy speak before and I thought he was fantastic. So I had to invite him to speak again. Um, and he's looking at industrializing your RPA through a virtual delivery center. That's Frank Schuler, Managing Director of Global Service Centers with DHL Freight Forwarding. And we're ending the day with a session um, by Goldman Sachs. So Denny Singh, the VP for Digital Finance at Goldman Sachs, is talking about governance and risk management for a scalable and strategic RPA program. Thank you again to Mike and Vivek for taking the time to put together their presentation and deliver it today. We really, really appreciate it. And to everyone else, I'll see you back here at nine o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, guys.